Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to NCHE's webinar. I'm Kathleen with NCHE, and I'm very excited to introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, Michael Witkin, who is now a professor of history at Columbia University, but has spent a great deal of time in southeastern Michigan, and we'll be talking about that more this evening. So he, you might be familiar with his works, uh, published a most recently book called Seeing Red, Indigenous Land, American Expansion, and the Political Economy of Plunder in North America, but he spent a great deal of time studying the Great Lakes region, and so I will turn it over to him to kick us off tonight. Welcome, Michael. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so uh, I'll switch to share screen in a second here, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of work through some slides to give you, situate you in terms of some maps and also objects of study, um, things to look at. So let me do that. And when the when I'm finished with the sort of formal part of the talk, I'll, I'll take down the screens for the Q&A. Um, okay, okay. Um, so I wanna begin my talk uh, during the territorial period of the Old Northwest, which for Michigan begins uh, in 1805 and ends in 1837 when the territory enters the Union as a state. However, rather than starting my talk in the Northwest Territories in general or with Michigan specifically, I wanna begin in the nation's capital. And in particular, I wanna spend a few minutes thinking about the Capitol Rotunda. The British burned uh, the buildings for the US Capitol in Washington, DC in 1814 during the War of 1812. Uh, the Capitol was rebuilt following the war around a central rotunda, which opened to the public uh, around 1824. The building was decorated with a series of bas relief murals commissioned by President John Adams between 1824 and 1829. Uh, at the time of their completion, these murals were the sole decorative elements built into the rotunda. Right now it's, it's full of all kinds of tchotchkes, but when you went into it in 1824, the only decorative art were these bas relief murals. Uh, congressmen and visitors entering the building looked upon a four-sided interior where a bas-relief sculpture carved out into each wall provided a narrative iconography depicting the national mythology of the United States. Anyone entering the rotunda would see the preservation of Captain Smith by Pocahontas above the west entrance, landing of the pilgrims uh, over the east entrance, William Penn's treaty with the Indians over the north entrance, and conflict with Daniel Boone and the Indians over the south entrance. Um, it's significant that the national mythology imagined by President Adams and the artwork that he commissioned for the rotunda was entirely linked to native peoples. The story of America presented in the iconography of these murals is synonymous with the story of indigenous peoples in North America. In the decades following the creation of the United States, most Americans would have encountered native peoples on a regular basis. Even if they were uh, did not interact with native peoples in person, they were regularly a subject matter of the President's State of the Union address, uh, Indian removal debate was a really important national issue in politics. Uh, Native characters featured prominently in popular cultural production, such as James Fenimore Cooper's Last of the Mohicans. Uh, this encounter with indigenous North America would have been particularly true in a Western state like Michigan, where interactions with Native peoples were commonplace. In Michigan territory, interacting with Native peoples was a regular occurrence for most individual settlers, for territorial officials, and for representatives of the federal government. In effect, the national mythology that linked American identity to the history of American Indians in the murals of the Capitol Rotunda represented the lived experience of most American people. The first two murals that were commissioned by Adams, the preservation of uh, Captain Smith and the landing of the pilgrims represent moments of encounter, but also moments of transfer. Pocahontas, the Indian princess, saves John Smith from the savagery of her father. Later, she, she marries an English colonist and converts to Christianity, signifying a joining of the English uh, fate, uh, a joining of the fate of English settlers and native peoples in North America. Her story reflects the settlers' triumph over native savagery and the English assimilation of native nobility. Pocahontas embodies uh, the civilizing mission of English colonization and, by extension, the American Republic. The second mural, the Wampanoag. Uh, Wampanoag welcome uh, pilgrims welcome uh, the Wampanoag welcome pilgrims were seeking refuge in North America. They share their corn and teach colonists to plant their own food crops. 
a sharing of knowledge needed to survive in the new world. In both of these historic moments, Americans have found meaning. These mythological representations of the past, both the murals and the stories themselves, do important ideological work. They signal an, independent, an indigenous acceptance of European settlement. More importantly, they suggest an indigenous complicity with the forging of these new world settlements by European empires and their successor, the United States. The mural of William Penn and Daniel Boone represent the other face of European empire. The histories imagined by these murals represent indigenous dispossession. The murals depicting Pocahontas and the pilgrims focus less on the dispossession that followed English colonization and more on the peaceful assimilation of native North America through the advance of civilization. In both stories, we can see savagery yielding to civilization. Penn's treaty with the Indians tells a similar story, but it more explicitly emphasizes the European acquisition of indigenous land in, in this effect, uh, this mural represents another peaceful transfer, native peoples yielding their land to English colonists. In the mural, William Penn, the Quaker, the embodiment of peace and nonviolence, shakes hands with Delaware chiefs, holding a signed treaty dated 1682 in his hand. This representation suggests the story of William Penn and his relationship with the Delaware. In 1681, the King of England, Charles II, gave Penn a charter making him... Uh, a sole proprietor of, of 45,000 square mile territory west of New Jersey in compensation for a debt that he owed to Penn's father. This grant made Penn the single largest landholder in British America. Uh, Charles claimed possession of this territory by right of discovery, and he transferred this claim of sovereignty to William Penn. In truth, as Penn soon learned, this land was the homeland of the Delaware or the Lenny Lenape whose descendants would assume a leadership role in the Confederacy of Native Nations in the Northwest Territories, led by famous Native leaders from Pontiac to Tecumseh. Arriving in his newly acquired territory in 1682, Penn traveled to the village of Shekamaxon, where he negotiated a treaty with the Delaware. Penn not only affirmed peace between his colony and the Delaware, but also paid 1,200 pounds for the land that he planned to sell to settlers. There is no surviving text for this treaty, and it was subsequently violated in the 18th century as Pennsylvania expanded deeper and deeper into the West, a recurring theme in American history of treaty making. Nevertheless, the act of diplomacy became part of the mythology of William Penn, the man who treated with the native peoples and treated with them fairly and as equals. Uh, this mural offers a vision of European expansion and the transfer of land from natives to European settlers, but it also suggests the potential for this process to unfold diplomatically and peacefully. Although one could also argue that there's a hidden darker meaning in the mural as well, uh, angered at English expansion onto their lands in violation of the 1682 treaty, the Delaware fought against the English in the Seven Years' War and later against Americans during the revolution and again in the Northwest Indian War in 1794 and again in the War of 1812. These conflicts produced bitter violence in Pennsylvania and Virginia back countries, uh, which was also part of the American popular culture. Uh, perhaps most famously captured in, in James Fenner Cooper's last of Mohicans novel or in The Legend of Daniel Boone. So in other words, Penn's treaty with the Indians foreshadowed a history of diplomatic failure, violence, and native dispossession. The idea of frontier violence, where settlers seeking a better life in the Western territories faced armed resistance from bloodthirsty savages, was also part of America's mythology. The story of Daniel Boone reflects this version of American history. And indeed, the final mural, Conflict of Daniel Boone and the Indians, presents a story of violent conquest. In this mural, Daniel Boone engages in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a shirtless warrior, rifle in one hand, long knife in the other. They both stand on top of a dead Indian. Popularized by John Filson's autobiography, published in 1784, Daniel Boone's story was the story of American expansion into the West. Quote, thus we behold Kentucky, Filson wrote, Lately, a howling wilderness, the habitation of savages and wild beasts, become a fruitful field. This region, so favorably distinguished by nature, now has become the habitation of civilization, end quote. Daniel Boone, the Indian fighter, defender of frontier settlements, represented the American story as a story of conquest, a triumph over wild and unsettled North American wilderness popular by bloodthirsty savages. This is the story of American pioneers pushing into the West to fulfill their destiny and settle the continent. In a sharp counterpoint to the story of William Penn, this mural suggests that there would be no place for native peoples in the American Republic. The conflict of Daniel Boone marks a temporal as well as a thematic shift in the murals. 
the relief moves from the 17th century to the 18th century and from the colonial era to the early national uh, period in American history. The other murals um, hold out the possibility of indigenous assimilation. Boone's mural seems to foreclose such inclusion. In this sense, the mural represents a shift from the revolutionary generation to the post-revolutionary ge generation. Political leaders like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington envisioned the possibility of some form of inclusion or assimilation for indigenous peoples, even if they imagined the demise of autonomous in, uh, indigenous nations. Most of the second generation of political leadership in the Republic, including the governor of Michigan territory, Lewis Cass, and President Andrew Jackson, the architects of the policy that would become known as Indian removal saw no future for indigenous peoples in the US, either as nations or as unenfranchised subjects or as citizens. In effect, the murals of the Capitol Rotunda commissioned to tell the story of the United States depict the two strands of thought about the future of native peoples in the Republic, assimilation or elimination. Whatever the future, however, to vanish or to assimilate, the story of the founding of the United States is told as a story about the encounter with the indigenous peoples of North America. I wanted to begin at the nation's capital because it compels us to think on a national and even on a global scale. The bas relief murals of the Capitol building were meant to reflect both the history and the national mythology of the founding of the American Republic. These murals tell the story of America as understood by the first post-revolutionary generation of Americans. And what these murals tell us is that the people of the United States believed they were part of a global story of discovery, the discovery of the new world. With this rhetorical sleight of hand, behold the existence of a new world, European powers claimed possession of North America by right of discovery. Existing in a state of nature, the continent was an uncultivated wilderness and therefore an unsettled land. Using the same logic, European powers established dominion over their new possessions by converting land and resources into private property that in turn became part of the colonial settlements effectively establishing sovereign governments where supposedly none had previously existed. From the European perspective, immigrant communities in North America represented civilization and human progress. Native communities represented the uncivilized or the savage. They represented a primitive form of humanity that failed to advance beyond the state of nature. This was the political logic that imagined North America as the new world, an uncivilized continent waiting to be settled. Colonial settlers imagined their arrival as the coming of civilization to this new world. The people of the United States imagined their newly formed republic to be the successor of this colonial project. American citizens and government officials uniformly regarded Western expansion as a spreading of civilization across a new world wilderness. When the colonists arrived in North America, they found nothing that they recognized as private property. Of course, they encountered native peoples with their own system of territoriality, distinct land use practices, and political and social organization. However, by insisting on only recognizing a definition of property, property rights, and political self-determination, specific to Western Europe, they could imagine that North America remained in a state of nature. Making this conceptual leap also required that the colonizers see indigenous peoples as less than fully human. Their humanity was recognized, but they were uncivilized or savage, meaning that by their very nature, they would be subordinate to the civilized peoples of Europe and later the US. The contention that native peoples were uncivilized and therefore inferior or subordinate to peoples of European descent was not based on any empirical evidence. It was instead based on an ontology or a political imaginary that assumed non-European peoples to be less than fully human while simultaneously presuming that European peoples represented the apex of humanity civilization. To be of European descent, and more importantly, to live according to the social, political, and economic mores and traditions of Western Europe was to be civilized. This was the ideology that shaped the political formation of the United States. For decades after its creation, the Republic founded on the idea that all men were created equal simply could not see native peoples as fully human. They were uncivilized, they were savages, their land was terra nullis, empty land, an unsettled wilderness. The Republic also denied the full equality of women and accepted the enslavement of people of African descent. The revolution had profound implications for white men, but at its founding, the union was far from perfect when it came to the recognition of universal human equality. The relationship of the Republic to native peoples, however, had the added component that it was also structured, uh, that it also structured the relationship of the United States to land in North America. Government officials, Indian agents, and countless settlers felt compelled to settle this land, to colonize it, 
to transform native homelands into American homesteads. For the people of the United States, established citizens and newly arriving immigrants to imagine native North America as anything other than an unsettled wilderness was simply impossible. To think of the continent as settled land as a viable alternative to the United States would be the domain of the unthinkable. That is to imagine that the self-determination of indigenous peoples have resulted in the creation of permanent dominion over their North American homelands would have been what the historian Michel Ruf Toyo has described as unthinkable history. For American officials like Thomas Jefferson, it was simply inconceivable to think about land in North America and imagine it as the inalienable land base of autonomous indigenous nations. Such a history would have been unthinkable. On the other hand, it was entirely conceivable to Jefferson that Napoleon Bonaparte, as ruler of the French Empire, had the right and the power to transfer ownership over 800,000 acres of territory controlled by indigenous peoples in the western interior of North America to the United States in the Louisiana Purchase. And here I want to return to the Northwest Territory and to Michigan. The logic behind European claims of discovery and behind land transfers like the Louisiana Purchase represent the same kind of logic that allowed the United States to claim possession of the Northwest Territory while in the conclusion of the Revolutionary War. The 1783 Treaty of Paris, which ended this conflict, set the western boundaries of the United States as the, at the east bank of the Mississippi River. The French Empire ceded this vast trans-Appalachian region to Great Britain when it lost the Seven Years' War. Britain ceded this region to the United States after the revolution. In spite of these multiple uh, claims of possessions and sovereignty by Britain, France, and the United States, the country between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River was occupied and controlled by a multitude of autonomous indigenous nations. Their constant violence, uh, the, the near constant violence between natives and settlers in the so-called back country, uh, west of the original 13 colonies during, of the American Republic during the Revolutionary War, provided ample evidence of the fact that this was an indigenous territory. In spite of the history of lawmakers in the United States uh, in spite of this history, lawmakers in the United States began to formulate plans to settle this region as soon as the Revolutionary War was over. The Republic needed a way to settle the West without provoking endless conflicts with Native peoples. It also wanted to prevent new settlements from forming independent of the United States or becoming attached to one of the territories administered by a European empire along the nation's southern and northern borders. In other words, Failure to expand not only meant leaving native land unsettled, it also carried the risk that a foreign power would bring civilization to the wilderness of North America and claim that territory for itself. From this perspective, devising a land policy that facilitated the expansion of the United States was a significant political imperative. Accordingly, one of the first congressional committees formed following the revolution was the Committee on Indian Affairs which submitted a report to the Continental Congress on October 15, 1783, arguing that the Indian policy of the Republic required the creation of a practical and enforceable land policy. Following their recommendation, the Congress immediately formed a new committee chaired by Thomas Jefferson, charged with the setting of a trade policy with the Indians and formulating a plan to settle the Western Territory. Uh, claimed by the United States. This first attempt resulted in a short-lived land ordinance of uh, 1784, which imagined the West divided into 10 new states. Uh, Jefferson produced a map uh, representing the scheme and actually showing 14 new states. Uh, the land ordinance and the map drawn by Jefferson to illustrate it, the outcome of this policy, represented a complete erasure of Native peoples from the political landscape in North America. And returning our attention briefly to the national project represented by the founding of the American Republic, it was also a reflection of the political imaginary that saw the continent as part of the new world, that is as unsettled and an uncivilized space that remained trapped in a state of nature. Unsettled territory could be claimed by any civilized power, however, and Congress worried that the land law that produced so many small states risked that some of those states might become detached from the Republic and join a rival European power with colonies on the continent. As a result of this fear, the committee that formulated the land ordinance of 1784 was reconstituted and began working on a revision uh, of the land law. The result 
was the Northwest Ordinance, a new law passed by Congress in 1787 that concentrated the political authority of the federal government in newly formed Western territories through the appointment of a territorial governor, a secretary, and three judges. Uh, the new ordinance organized the Northwest Territory into a territory that would be further divided into no less than three and no more than five districts or states. Once the population reached 5,000 free white males, the new territory would then elect a, a general assembly that would govern in consultation with the appointed officials. The Northwest Ordinance stipulated that, quote, all states may be formed therein, shall forever remain a part of the Confederacy of the United States, end quote. When the population reached 60,000 free inhabitants, the territory would be authorized to draft a state constitution and request admission to the Union on equal footing with the original 13 states. Significantly, all states created by the Northwest Ordinance would be free states and all state constitutions must contain a fugitive slave law. The Northwest Ordinance uh, shifted the focus of Western settlement away from the establishment of new fully enfranchised sovereign states. Instead, the ordinance sought to establish an effective territorial government that could secure property rights, enforce the rule and law, and manage relations with native peoples. Section eight, the following uh, stipulated that the governor, section eight of the Northwest Ordinance stipulated that the governor shall, quote, proceed from time to time as circumstances may require to lay out parts of a district in which Indian titles have been extinguished and turn them into counties and townships, end quote. The ordinance also guaranteed the right of inheritance uh, for the states of both residents and non-residents, asserted the right of habeas corpus, the right to a trial by jury, and ensured the sanctity of contracts as well as the freedom of religion. It also stipulated that all navigable waterways leading to the Mississippi and the St. Lawrence rivers should be common highways and forever free. In effect, the Northwest Ordinance was designed to facilitate the sale and rapid settlement of land in the public domain under a legal regime recognized by the United States. In creating the legal mechanism for the orderly transfer of native land to white property holders, the federal authorities hope to attract a steady flow of immigrants into Western territories claimed by the United States. Organized politically by the federal government, it also uh, minimized the possibility that settlers would seek uh, to form new states independent of the United States and providing for the possible creation and settlement of up to five free states in Northwest uh, Ordinance provided a solution to the rapid expansion of slave power and slave states that was occurring simultaneously in the Southwest. The ordinance designated the vast public domain of the Trans-Appalachian Northwest as a subsidized land base for white settlers. Uh, in exchange for this transfer of wealth to white settlers in the North, the free states of the Northwest Territories would guarantee the property of rights, uh, the property rights of white Southerners. The fugitive slave law required in each new state constitution secured their right to hold enslaved black people as chattel property and to recover this property if enslaved individuals sought to secure their freedom by moving into Northern free states. Native dispossession underpinned the system of property rights, land transfers, and the eventual extension of the full franchise to white men willing to move into the Northwest Territory. Section 8 of the Ordinance of 1787 required federally appointed governors to work to extinguish native title on indigenous homelands that would be part of any newly organized territory or state. These lands, according to the ordinance, would therein be converted to counties and townships by the governor. On the other hand, Article 3 of the ordinance stated that the utmost good faith should always be observed toward the Indians, their lands and property shall never be taken from them without consent. This pledge, however, came with a caveat. They shall never be invaded or disturbed unless in just and lawful wars authorized by Congress. Embodied in this contradiction was the unthinkable history that sovereign native nations could have produced native homelands that were permanent settlements as opposed to unsettled wilderness. These contradictions were not only written into the law, but reflected the ideology that informed the social contract established by the Republic. Like the U.S. Constitution, also drafted in 1787, the Northwest Ordinance was a legal document designed to create and preserve a politically legitimate settlement on territory that was part of the public domain of the United States, but which remained unsettled from the perspective of the common law of the U.S., but uh, uh, the, the common law of the U.S. court system. The Northwest Ordinance, in effect, provided a legal mechanism for reproducing the original 13 states of the Union in the West. The Northwest Ordinance reflected Thomas Jefferson's vision of a future for Native peoples living on lands claimed by the United States. Their homelands will be ceded to the U.S. 
However, reflecting the same logic embodied in the murals on the Capitol Rotunda, Jefferson imagined two possible futures for Native peoples. As Jefferson informed Governor William Henry Harrison of the Indiana Territory in 1803, our settlements will gradually circumscribe and approach the Indians, and they will in time rather incorporate with us as citizens of the United States or remove beyond the Mississippi. This, he concluded, will result in, quote, the termination of their history, most happy for themselves, end quote. This was the fate that he imagined for Native peoples, become citizens of the Republic and suffer a cultural death as Native people, or leave. There would only be one nation within the boundaries of the territory claimed by the Republic. While Jefferson could not imagine an Indigenous future, he could at least imagine a path toward Indigenous assimilation. For most white Americans, citizens, and immigrants, uh, this vision of a West open for settlement and emptied of Indigenous nations must have been compelling. Indiana made the transition from territory to state in 16 years, becoming a state in 1816, meaning that 60,000 white settlers arrived in the territory during this time. The state of Illinois made a similar transition, organized as a territory in 1809, admitted to the Union as a state in 1818. As Jefferson's letter to Governor Harrison suggests, however, the settlers did not arrive to discover an empty wilderness. They moved into a country that still had an indigenous population. Although the demography of these territories would have been rapidly changing, the settlers lived with and around Native peoples who stubbornly refused to go away or assimilate. The questions about their future and their place in the Republic would have been discussed not only by government officials like Jefferson and Harrison, but also by settlers who were their neighbors throughout the Trans-Appalachian Western Territory. This would have been particularly true for the few American settlers who migrated to the region north and west of the Ohio River. Uh, Michigan organized as a territory in 1805, but it did not enter the Union as a state until 1837. Wisconsin was organized as a territory that same year, but did not enter the Union as a state until 1848. Minnesota, the last unsettled region of the Northwest Territory, was not organized uh, until 1849 and was admitted to the Union in 1858, shortly before the Civil War. In effect, throughout the most of the Northwest Territory, Native peoples actually constituted the majority of the population on the lands claimed by the U.S. in the first half of the 19th century. In 1820, while the southern tier of the Northwest Territory had been transformed into the states of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, with their requisite populations uh, of 60,000 or more white settlers, the majority of the territory of Michigan, uh, uh, the majority of the territory remained a homeland for a multitude of indigenous peoples. In 1820, fewer than 9,000 white settlers lived in Michigan territory, which stretched at that time from the Detroit River uh, in, in the east to the Mississippi River in the west. 23 years after the creation of the Northwest Ordinance, the majority of the Northwest Territory was, in reality, still Native territory. It was not an unsettled uh, new world, but rather a Native world, a composite landscape of Indigenous peoples living in their homelands and connected to the global market economy through trade carried out with European, American, and Canadian traders and trading companies. The Native peoples of Michigan Territory had effectively ignored or rejected the civilizing mission of the United States. Equally significant, virtually all of the 9,000 white settlers living in this territory ignored it as well. Most non-Native residents would have been engaged in the fur trade, either as merchants in Detroit or Prairie du Chien, or as traders living and working in posts attached to Native villages. In 1820, the fur trade dominated the political economy of Michigan, which meant that the white population actually needed the Native population to continue living as Native peoples. And the Southeast King Cotton was transforming the economy of the region, and e even large, powerful Native nations like the Cherokee and the Creek felt the pressure to adapt their political economy to the market economy of the U.S. Many Native peoples in the Southeast became slave-owning commercial cotton farmers. The cotton economy was also drawing the capital and populations of the Upper South, both white and enslaved, into the burgeoning economies of the Mississippi and Alabama, admitted into the Union as states in 1817 and 1819. Meanwhile, Michigan Territory, with no direct access or, or water route uh, to the Mississippi and to market cities like New Orleans and St. Louis, languished as a federally administered territory with a majority Native population. That is, until the opening of the Erie Canal completed in 1825. By 1830, the non-Native population of Michigan Territory had gone to a little over 31,000 people, but that enumeration included settlers living as far west as the Mississippi and was less than the number needed to require the, the, uh, the, for the requirement to become a state. By 1834, however, 
Only nine years after the opening of the Erie Canal, the settler population in the lower peninsula of Michigan, east of Lake Michigan, had reached over 85,000 people. This rapid transition uh, up into the fur trade in the Great Lakes placed enormous pressure on territorial officials to extinguish native title to native homelands and to convert that land into public domain. This pressure culminated in the 1836 Treaty of Washington, shown here on this map, uh, um, which was negotiated by the United States with the Anishinaabe Dodomek of the Michigan Territory. The Ogimak, or leaders uh, of bands of Odawa and Ojibwe peoples living in the upper and northern lower peninsula, were taken to Washington, D.C. in 1836, where they were coerced into ceding approximately 13 million acres of land to the Republic for the price of an annual payment or annuity of $30,000 for 20 years, which amounted to about seven cents per acre. This treaty also paid out uh, $300,000 to traders who claimed the Anishinaabe owed them money for goods provided on credit that they had failed to pay back for the fur trade and processed animal peltry. It also allocated $150,000 to mixed race Anishinaabe compensation for their part in the land session, but also offering them uh, a cash payment instead of the creation of a land base reserved for them exclusively in their home territory. The 1836 Treaty of Washington was one of the uh, one of a large number of treaties that the United States negotiated with indigenous nations in the Northwest Territory. The treaty process in the Northwest Territory provided the U.S. with a largely peaceful means of forcing Native nations to cede territory and their homelands to the Republic, even though the Republic already claimed dominion or sovereignty over this territory. These treaties represented a massive transfer of wealth from Native peoples to the citizens of the United States. Native peoples created or ceded title to their lands to the federal government, which then converted that territory into the public domain of the United States. The federal government, acting as the sole proprietor over this land base, made it available for purchase as private property to settlers. These settlers were almost exclusively white, and they took possession of this land at a subsidized price in exchange for settling Native homelands and making them part of the American Republic. In doing so, they entered into a social contract with the United States. They would not be colonists settling a foreign territory for the mother country, but rather citizens creating homesteads and settlements in Indian country that their government had deemed untitled or unsettled land, but over which it ex exercised dominion or sovereignty. Under the terms of the Northwest Ordinance, those settlements would be organized politically as territories, administered as they grew uh, by the federal government, and when the population reached 60,000 uh, free settlers, the territories we could then seek admission to the Union as states. The treaty process in the Northwest Territory not only represented a massive transfer of wealth in the form of land transfers from Native peoples to white American settlers, they also represented a massive infusion of money in the form of specie or currency into the regional economy. These treaties resulted in annuities or cash payments, which, though designated for Native peoples, would mostly wind up in the hands of traders, territorial officials, and local merchants. Many of the white settlers, traders, and officials who claimed this money were able to do so because they had married into Native communities uh, being forced to bargain with the United States. These white interlocutors most often had Native wives and even mixed-race Native children, and they facilitated the negotiation of treaties acting as interpreters, counselors, debt collectors to the leadership of Indigenous nations forced to negotiate the terms of their dispossession. Representatives of the federal government made it clear to Native leaders that these treaties represented their only chance for receiving compensation for the land which the U.S. was going to take into its possession. In this sense, treaty making between Native nations and the federal government represented an involuntary or coercive process. Moreover, the treaty process, the land sessions, the annuity payments, the providing of goods and provisions uh, to Native negotiators represented a political economy of plunder. The political economy of plunder became the means by which the Republic of the United States expanded into the Northwest. Through the creation, uh, through, through the creation of the 1787 land law, the federal government established a legal mechanism that linked state formation to economic production and, and indigenous dispossession. The law used the power of the federal government to extinguish native title to land and then facilitated uh, the development of that land as private property. This represented a massive transfer of wealth from Native peoples to U.S. citizens as their homelands were converted into individual homesteads that constituted an expansion of the territory of the American Republic. This was not an economic transaction, but rather a plundering of Native land and Native wealth. 
The plunder economy not only stripped native peoples of their homelands, their most valuable resource, but also deprived them of just compensation for this loss. Cash payments for their land were systematically claimed as debt by traders, merchants, and Indian agents who maximized their profit by also supplying manufactured goods and provisions of food that the government agreed to be uh, to, would serve as part of their payments for their annuity. In effect, the Northwest Territory, the political economy of plunder, represented a mode of colonization that the United States masked as the physical expansion of the Republic onto unsettled Western lands. As soon as the economies of the new territories in the Northwest could accommodate 60,000 free settlers, they could enter the Union as full-fledged states with all the rights and prerogatives of the original 13. In the Northwest Territory, the political economy of plunder was the engine behind the economic growth that made it possible to create and economically develop uh, new states. Uh, in other words, the United States acted as a colonial power, systematically subjugating and exploited Native people and their resources, even as the United States expanded at the expense of Native peoples. However, Indigenous people remained outsiders in the Republic being created through their dispossession. That is, Native peoples were not citizens of the United States, even though many Native peoples continued to live in states being created out of the Northwest Territory. In this sense, the United States represented, uh, operated as both a settler colonial state and a traditional colonial power um, operating from the outside. This map shows the creation of, Ameri uh, of, the United of Michigan carved out of the indigenous territory that Anishinaabe called Anishinaabewake through a series of 11 treaties that systematically uh, stripped the territory uh, except for small reservations in each uh, tribal community and transferred that territory to the public domain of the United States. When 13 uh, of Great Britain's North American colonies rebelled and formed the United States, citizens of this newly created republic imagined that they had created an end to uh, the continent's first uh, colon colonial power and created the first continent's first post-colonial social formation. Political independence severed the colonial relationship that tethered the former colonies to the British Empire. In truth, however, while the republic created a new social contract between settlers and their government, the United States, as a new polity, continued to function as a settler colony. This new society, with its origin as a collection of colonial settlements, had been established by the dispossession and displacement of indigenous people. Uh, more importantly, the political framework that created the Republic envisioned the need for continuous expansion into the indigenous territories along its western border. Most of the leading political and intellectual figures of the American Republic, from the revolutionary period to the early national period, believed that all of indigenous North America would eventually be incorporated into the United States. In effect, Americans like their imperial predecessors, discovered the necessity of continuing the project of colonizing Native North America. This was a civilizing mission of the United States. It is important to recognize that the civilizing mission of the United States was a totalizing ideological project. This was not merely a projected uh, project aimed at civilizing Native people. The project was about the transformation of a continent, and that transformation never imagined a political future for Native peoples. For citizens, of the new republic, the idea that a burgeoning United States would yield to the territorial sovereignty of native nations would have been unthinkable. Treaty making, however, was a diplomatic process. This process allowed the US to acquire native land peacefully, but it also offered the possibility of a political future for indigenous peoples to continue existing as indigenous peoples. When native nations signed treaties with the US, they either attempted to limit American expansion and maintain some measure of their own homeland and their freedom, or they accepted the political bargain of inclusion promised by the American settler state. Either way, whatever path the nation chose represented an attempt to preserve an indigenous future. The idea of the civilizing mission, central to America's Indian policy, represented a promise of inclusion. Eliminate the native through assimilation or removal uh, with the promise of eventual assimilation and inclusion within the civil society created by the Republic. This bargain played out in dramatic fashion as America expanded into the Old Southwest, eliminating uh, Indians through forced removal and establishing new territories that were incorporated into the Republic. In the Old Northwest, in contrast, the U.S. was forced to act as a colonial state, an exogenous power forced into an ongoing relationship with a permanently subordinated indigenous population, non-citizens forced to live as colonial subjects on homelands claimed by the federal government. The American Republic was a nation of settlers struggling to colonize native North America. Accepting this fact that America has always been a colonial power reveals American expansion for what it was and for what it was not. It was not 
a nation of immigrants selling a savage or untamed wilderness. The Republic was a nation of settlers struggling to colonize native North America. Thinking through the mechanics of Western expansion, like the Northwest Ordinance or the iconography of the Capitol Rotunda, we see the United States locked in a fight with indigenous people about the meaning of place and belonging in North America. We see the American Republic as a colonial power doing what colonial powers do, subordinating native peoples while plundering their land and resources, and wherever it was legally possible and financially profitable, using enslaved people of African descent to do so. Accepting this reality, we are also forced to acknowledge that we cannot disentangle American history and indigenous history, nor can we disentangle the history of native dispossession from the history of slavery or Western expansion, or even the emergence of free soil politics that would shape the, the Republic's uh, uh, trajectory leading to the Civil War. In conclusion, the American experiment required indigenous dispossession. And with that, I'll leave you with this image of a treaty signature page. It's a legal document transferring the 13 million acres of Anishinaabe territory and Michigan territory uh, into the possession of the United States government uh, by virtue of X marks made by in indigenous people who couldn't read the document that they were providing an X mark for. Uh, thank you, Miigwech. That's all I have for now. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have some time for questions. Everyone feel free um, to include some questions in the Q&A box or in the chat. Um, we do have one question for you already. Uh, so did this European thinking toward indigenous peoples and African slaves stem from the enlightenment? This, I'm not sure um, exactly. I'm not sure um, how to answer that. Um, it stemmed from the enlightenment. Um, uh, I think it mostly evolved kind of out of the history of colonization. I think, um, you know, the first uh, colonists to arrive aren't really thinking in terms of racialized identity. They are um, usually thinking in terms of, of this domain of savagery and civilization and also kind of Christian and non-Christian. And then in Northeastern America, they're even thinking in terms of uh, Protestant Christian versus the Catholics, the French to their north and the Spanish to the south. And they're really thinking more along those lines um, as opposed to racialized lines. And that begins to change, especially with the incorporation of chattel slavery, where which is increasingly racialized and starts leading to sort of uh, thinking about difference as a, a racialized thing, not necessarily as a, um, a cultural or religious thing. And, and I would throw in an ad that indigenous people encountering Europeans don't think of them as as in terms of racial terms. Um, they think of them as, you know, not Wampanoag or uh, in the same way that a, an Iroquois is not Wampanoag, though these are you know English people. So I think the I think racial racialization happens um, kind of over time, and really I think um, partly out of the experience of of um, the larger colonial experience in the Americas, more so than Enlightenment abstracted. Um, before we move on to the next question, I did just want to acknowledge um, Jim made a great comment in the chat, which is thinking about that treaty, the image of the treaty you showed, just that those X marks are so significant and um, disturbing. <laughs> yeah, I like, you know, I like to, I like, I, I am with those, a lot of people haven't seen something like that. And I think it's important to think about that's that slide that I threw up there. Um, you, you, you all from Michigan. Um, this slide, uh, but that, this this is the 13 million acres. Um, this is the document that that uh, transferred that landmass into the possession of the United States. And the, the other thing that's striking about that is not only that those names are phonetically spelled by a translator, the X isn't actually even made by the the indigenous leader. The translator makes the X, and then the indigenous leader would come up and touch the pen. So it was called touching the pen. So they weren't even consenting in the sense of making an X. They were touching an X made for them. It's a pretty striking. Thing. And I think when you realize that that probably wouldn't stand up in a court today as a legal document transferring that much uh, property, it's, it's pretty stunning. Exactly. And how many millions and millions of acres were uh, transferred that way? Yeah. Um, okay. Another great question um, from Frank. Did you say that Native Americans in the South settled and created farms that enslaved Africans? Yes. Um, 
Throughout Native North America, there is a there, there, there are systems of captive taking and captive adoption is, is is part of a process that that is practiced throughout most of Native North America. Um, but it's not the same as chattel slavery. It's usually captives who are taken for inclusion in in communities to help make up for population losses, especially when they were suffering abnormally hard large losses from disease and things like that. Um, in the South, this process begins to merge with um, chattel slavery and and there are um indian nations who participate in the slave in the slave trade uh choctaws cherokees and creeks all become slavers they slave uh enslave indigenous people of the coast that they're selling to english um slave traders who are operating out of the carolinas and selling them into uh slavery in the west indies and then later on um the tribes that americans now call the five civilized tribes the uh, choctaw chickasaw creek cherokees and the seminoles almost all become slaveholding societies and they um, uh, um, most of them Creeks and Cherokees in particular become commercial cotton farmers where some individuals own um, uh, slaves and cotton plantations very similar to the US. In fact, that's where you get what's now called um, freedmen's roles. So uh, when they're all removed to Oklahoma and their trail of tears that I referenced there with expansion, you know, settler colonialism in the Southeast works like settler colonialism, that is it replaces natives pretty ruthlessly because they really want that land. People aren't dying for land in, in northern Michigan, although you might kill for it now for a nice uh, summer property. But, you know, in 1830, you're not dying to live in Leewana. Um, it, it's um, not a lot to do up there commercially. But if you're in Alabama, you can make a fortune as a cotton farmer. So they quickly force out those native peoples and they are forced to the Trail of Tears. They take their slaves with them. Um, and in fact, uh, the uh, the, the indigenous nations that have slaves then um, are able to rebuild in part with the slave labor. And then following the Civil War, uh, they're, they're forced to free, free their slaves and they create roles along with the tribal citizenship roles for all of the, the um, uh, now freedmen form of slaves who've been part of their communities that were supposed to get the same benefits um, that they were in, per any treaty settlement with the U.S. So yeah, it's a, it's a wild history. I would recommend um, books by my close friend and also former University of Michigan colleague, Taya Miles, has a book called Ties That Bind on uh, Afro-Cherokee slavery and it's a, it's a, uh, several other books, really excellent stuff. That's excellent. And is it, uh, oh, Patty mentioned um, Taya Miles' book, Dawn of Detroit as well. Dawn of Detroit, yeah, another, uh, also fantastic, which also is really good because it also, um, a key thing I think is that that you you can think um, being in the north we get we we, we get free of the um, the stain of slavery but there's actually slavery in Detroit um, practice uh, before the U.S. period period and after even as uh, Michigan is created as a free state there are old time mostly um, French descended residents who still own slaves um, so yep another good book. Um, okay, uh, from Kelly, it's a great question. Are there any Native women that you feel should be highlighted in U.S. history classes, aside from Sacagawea and Pocahontas? Uh, you know, in Michigan, you, you could, if you're teaching in Michigan, um, the uh, Green Prairie woman, who is the, uh, um, right, the Henry Rural Schoolcraft's wife, Jane Schoolcraft, um, I, you could teach her, there's a, I believe a collection of her writings has been published. Um, I can't remember the a scholar who published it, but she's a um, Jane Schoolcraft is the mixed race daughter of Green Prairie woman and John uh, um, John Johnson, who's a like a Scottish board trader operating at Sault Ste. Marie, and he believed in educating his daughters, and so they 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 were um, they were both bilingual, uh, they were could read and write, and Jane Schoolcraft um, had literary ambitions and wrote. She ended up marrying um, uh, Henry Schoolcraft, the, who became the Indian agent for Michigan, a rather unfortunate fellow, I must say. Um, and uh, Henry Schoolcraft becomes kind of an Indian expert by by essentially taking his wife's knowledge and publishing a series of books. Um, so you can, however, recover Jane Schoolcraft's, um, yeah, Kathleen Barker. Um, you, you can uh, recover Jane Schoolcraft's collected works. Um, and I think there might be some stuff on uh, Green Prairie Woman, who is her mother, is a hugely important woman in the territorial period of Michigan. She's like a... Um, a sugar baron. She controls um, uh, huge stands of, of maples in the north and has a basically sugar uh, maple sugar business that is really important. Um, she's really important in um, a couple an incident when when uh, Lewis Cath makes his way up, uh, north in the 1820s 
um, trying to uh, fly the flag in Sault Ste. Marie at a time when they were, the U.S. was nervous about their uh, Indian connection with Great Britain, and she helps to stabilize a fight that almost breaks out between uh, caste and American soldiers and, and Ojibwe. So she's a remarkable woman. She has diplomatic and economic history in, in um, the U.S. Um, so that's a, a really excellent kind of regional person to put in there. Excellent. And we have great mentions in the chat of some other uh, Michigan figures who were slave owners. Um, those of you in Michigan will probably recognize the Macomb family, um, Lewis Cass, right? Yeah. Um, okay, another great question. Um, did the uh, long history, hundreds of years of history of Native Americans trading with the French for furs, later as war allies, prepare Native leaders for trading for land as equals? Did any of that trade prepare them? <laughs> not, not really. Um, well, I mean, yes and no. I, I, I say that that's uh, that's too glib an answer. Um, you know, part of the problem was they weren't really trading fairly for land. Um, they were they were being coerced into signing treaties, um, and, and they were often told that. And so, in in sense, they weren't really prepared for. They were they were prepared. They, they kept they knew the value of the land, and they didn't want to sell it. And so, in that sense, they they were they knew how the market worked. They knew how. Uh, uh, Capitalism worked. They've been participating in a capitalist market economy um, for well over a century before the United States was created, um, and and they're saying no. My um, my great great grandfather signed the the same treaty uh, for Wisconsin in eighteen thirty seven that alienated uh, eleven million acres in northern Wisconsin. Uh, said in in treaty in recorded treaty council records, I don't I, I refuse to to see this land. And the the Indian agent says we will take the land from you. So you can cede it now or not. And the bargain he strikes is that um, the U.S. government has to promise they won't try to affect removal and that he will have a territory that his children's children could be still born in that, in that territory. So in some senses, they're, they're bargaining with what they have um, at their disposal. They know how to bargain. They know what the land's worth. Um, but they're sort of in a bad position um, because the U.S. isn't taking no for an answer. Let's see, we have, um, oh, some great questions about naming in our Southeastern Michigan area, uh, the influence of city and street names um, or the influence of Native Americans on city and street names. Um, if you have any suggestions for learning more or any insight. Um, probably not anymore that most of you all know, like Detroit really just means the straight and it's not Fort Pontchartrain. Uh, and then, uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, you know, not anything in particular. Uh, I think there, there's, I mean, it's it's kind of really, it's it's fun when you're teaching, especially, um, well, any level, really, I think you're teaching just to, in thinking about the the, what, the nature of colonialism, settler colonialism, that, that there are both like French names, and that there's also indigenous names that survive. Um, uh, Muskegon, which, you know, means a swamp, um, survives. And if you're out in that part of Michigan, back in the day, it would have been a swampy part of Michigan. Um, so, or uh, Sleeping Bear, Mukwadnabad is how you would say Sleeping Bear in Ojibwe, um, still has the same thing. So it's why things keep indigenous names when they get transferred, those things are always kind of interesting. Um, it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's a wild thing. I don't know, I drive around and I see Lewis Cass and, and um, Henry Schoolcraft plaster all over thing, drives me crazy. Um, that they're getting they're getting some credit that they shouldn't get credit for. I don't know. Getting the name stuff. I don't know. Well, I think we, we need a, a motion to rename things, at least for Jane Schoolcraft. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We can start that story, that rumor. It's really about Jane. Um I, I did as an aside um some report I did contribute to I I somebody called that was trying to the mission was trying to get Lewis Cass removed from the um the Congress. And I did contribute to somebody asked me um for information about how, how to affect that. And I did provide um, information that because Lewis Cass was a horrible person, but anyway. <laughs> oh, there's a lot more to that story. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Oh, here's, okay. So here's a another political question. Um, why did states joining the Northwest Ordinance uh, wait so long to establish a, a formal constitution? Um, it seemed like a long time to wait for 60,000 people uh, to have a more organized government. So uh, in, in part, um, the U.S. is prioritizing growth, economic growth over completing corporations. So 
at 5,000, um, each at five, so the Northwest Ordinance is at 5,000 free settlers, you can organize the territory. So that's enough to, by organizing territory that helps provide the infrastructure to start growing the population. Uh, and instead of giving it instant um, equality status, which could, um, they, they thought could be problematic and could, it, um, it was smart to sort of uh, grow the sort of capitalize the, the, the territory so that it was, uh, had an infrastructure that could sustain a population, a population that could justify inclusion. So that they um, set it out so that it was um, not like throwing, so they were throwing out like a colony, like they, they felt the colonists had been thrown out um, as subordinate with not full rights. So it was a way of giving you rights, but also growing your your population until it was ready to sort of enter the union. I, I would note the other interesting thing is that the, the Northwest Ordinance stipulates you have to have 5,000 free settlers and 60,000 free citizens, uh, citizens to, or free settlers to be a state. Every single state constitution in the Northwest Territory, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan, uh, and they all change that from free to free white. So they all make whiteness, uh, a, a, a the state constitutions all change that status defining the franchise and citizenship to not free uh, inhabitants, which could include free blacks uh, uh, conceivably, um, but to free white uh, people. So. So they were, they, they were, they were not messing around with the racism at that time. And of course, they were pushing out governments that did exist, right? <laughs> Organized types of government that were there already. Yes. Uh, so this is a question for you, and some of our participants might also have some good answers for this. Um, talking about fifth graders who were astounded <laughs> when they learned that uh, Disney got a lot of things wrong with Pocahontas. Yeah. Um, so, um, how can I share more information with my 10 and 11 year old students, um, as they study this age of exploration and the 13 colonies revolution? Um, um there's, a book, there's a book by Camilla Townsend, um, about Pocahontas. She's a scholar, I think from Rutgers. Um, it, it, it's, it's not a book that you would give to your fifth graders, obviously, but you, you could use it as a resource for yourself. Um, you know, there's another, um, there is a book. It's probably too much for fifth graders, but there's a book that the um, the the um, uh, the Paw Monkey community that from which she's descended um, have have a history of her. I can't think of it. Um, I'm trying. To, I'm looking at my shelves. That's why I'm staring off that way. Um, I'm just. I just. I, I just taught a class with it. Um, I thought it was over here. I, I can try. Yeah, I, I'm missing it. There's a there's a book by the um, Custalo is the uh, C U S T A L O W is the last name of one of the authors of the book. Um, Don Custalo, I think. Um, it's a a, a book pr produced by the community, the descendants of Pocahontas. It's also a pretty good book uh, in terms of uh, they try to and they try to match up their oral history with do documentary evidence or history. So, um, and then there's um, there's teaching resources to the digital public library um um that you can you can get at and look at that kind of stuff um but yeah they definitely um it, it, it de Disney definitely is off the mark not the least of which that Pocahontas is like 12 and John Smith is like in his 30s so uh, a romantic relationship would have been less beyond inappropriate or the fact that when she marries an English person she'd been held captive um for over two years at the time so Voluntary marriage or a coercive way to get out of being held captive? I don't know. Um, tough stuff. Although I would also jump in and say I do teach with Disney Pocahontas all the time because it it's, I mean, it is what it is. And, and the mythology around Pocahontas is a super important part of American mythology because it does all kinds of ideological work. It, it has, you know, a native nobility marrying voluntarily uh, English people. It's a blending and coming together. It's a consent to colonization. It does all kinds of ideological work. And so it's always been a really popular story or mythology in American history. And so I think sometimes helping people think through the difference between history and mythology can be important. You know, even at a fifth grade level, they can make distinctions between um, thinking about the past in terms of historicizing it and thinking about the past in terms of storytelling and mythology. Um, so all, all those sorts of things. Excellent. Well, we are at 830. So I wanted to say thank you very much to Michael for joining us tonight. Thank you to all of you for your questions, for the great links in chat. Um, it's really been awesome talking to you and learning more about the Great Lakes region um, and Michigan. And we look forward to reading your book.
Yeah, so, and for all you teachers out there, man, thank you for doing the good fight. Um, I became a historian because they had great uh, teachers in high school and junior high school, great historical teachers. So thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks everyone for joining us. Bye-bye.